you know, it's pretty cool looking. I think people would like that plane. Um, it's a big, roomy, four or five place motor glider, but it has a lot of limitations. Very efficient, but it's not very practical. And so we can't really call things like this state of the art, even though we continue to produce long wingspan, high aspect ratio, uh, relatively speed limited airplanes that are difficult to manufacture and inherently expensive. So the problem of where we are on the, on the graph here versus getting more L over D takes us backwards. If you take a, a typical general aviation airplane and you say, well, let's, let's focus on the induced drag problem, let's give a longer wingspan, we wind up slowing down in the quest for more L over D. You don't necessarily need more L over D. What you'd like to have is greater fundamental efficiency. So as the unsuccessful and or semi-dangerous Synergy is inherently stable. In fact, that's one of the things that's most striking about it. It's solid as a rock. It also has some interesting attributes in, in its flight. When you turn, let me see if I can illustrate this. Looks like we're going to make a left turn here. Okay, that's a really radical roll rate uh, if you had that much deflection, which you don't. But it, let's say you had that much, a little bit of uh, deflection less than what you see there. What happens is, is this is making a little more drag, and this is making a little less. And that's the opposite of what you'd have with a, a regular airplane. So instead of having an adverse yaw condition, or acting against it with the third airplane, not just the wingless, but the, the upper turret plane, which is what we're going to That's a little bit from. So let's talk about the ingredient technologies in a little more detail. Natural laminar flow gets you half the drag of a tur turbulent flow airplane. Uh, we're not doing it very much on fuse flew in 2007. It was not designed to demonstrate any of the drag reduction technologies. Those were already demonstrated. What it was designed to do was to tell me whether or not I had uh, my simulators lying to me. And it told me that, uh, that they weren't lying at all. It told me that they were... Uh, that they were right on. Sounds pretty cool, but the drag sound that you hear uh, is because we didn't have any of the gorgeous wing filleting on there at the time. It was done with without any of the wing fillets at all, so there's a real turbulent flow environment into the prop. But that is about two-thirds throttle on a two kilowatt electric motor. The aircraft weighs 30 pounds, and it has um, just, it's not dynamically scaled at all, it's just proportionately scaled, drop down from full size version 18 vert uh, synergy. So it has about 16 times the drag of our full scale airplane. Uh, the other reason that we built it, and I'll go back to that slide here, was to validate the um, structural finite element analysis. I was concerned, you know, there's no baseline for how this stuff flexes and moves and bends, and, and uh, I needed a baseline. So when we put this together, we found out that uh, the stresses were quite manageable. The direction that they would occur in was totally different from what you'd expect. And we had to mitigate that with, uh, with a lot of different things for the full-scale version of the plane. This is a graph of the displacement of the version 24 airplane. It basically matches a, uh, a graph of the optimum body of revolution at this Reynolds number. In other words, our airplane body with wings on it is displacing the volume of air in the same way that a smoothly streamlined, optimized body of revolution would. And that has a lot to do with reducing the wing interference drag problem that everyone wants to point out. It exists with box wings. Box wing airplane in particular have a huge wing interference drag problem at each intersection. But when you have favorable biplane interference, you don't have that problem. 
we've got not only subsonic area ruling helping us out to mitigate the drag of uh, intersections, but we also have this phenomenon of favorable biplane interference. And I want to mention just for a minute uh, the fact that no program presently gets this right that I've seen other than just uh, direct element modeling in CFD. All of your spreadsheet calculator programs and stuff like that and the textbook methods, X-Plane, uh, they all give you negative biplane interference. And so if this was a wing pushing air down and that's a wing pushing air down, you're gonna have them fighting over the air in between. But what we have with Synergy is favorable or constructive biplane interference. Because they're operating at different opposing angles of attack, the upper surface talks to the bottom and the bottom talks to the top and together they're able to accelerate and influence a larger volume of air than either airflow alone. It's a venturi. So we're creating a venturi over each wing. And that causes favorable uh, translations of the pressure gradients between the elevons, the winglets, the V-tails, and the wing. And your uh, supposed interference strike problem pretty much goes out the window. What little remains is easily uh, addressed by having a stagger and uh, blended, really nicely blended configurations. We do have um, a one of our actual winglets uh, modeled up and brought it. We'll have it at the Aero Innovate event later on. So that's mostly the overview of Synergy. I know uh, there's a lot of questions out there, and I want to take them. If you have any more detailed information, uh, want more detailed information, like I said, go to our website, our Facebook page, and or Google Synergy Aircraft, and uh, you'll find out a lot. And if you don't get your satisfaction there, give me a call or an email. I'm happy to answer your questions. Let's start now. What do you got? question was the ultimate goal uh, is to is it to create a kit from this aircraft um, we've already learned that people want this plane so we have to respond to a demand for it somehow I designed synergy to be a, a study in alternative manufacturing techniques and processes to deliver the kind of airplane improvement at the kit market level that we've seen in the radio control world um, we, I used to build stick and tissue balsa models just like everybody else and graduated on up to Monaco and I thought that was the greatest thing in the world. But nowadays, of course, you buy an almost ready to fly kit and plug in three parts and you go fly your airplane. That's where the kit market can go if manufacturers are willing to shoulder the risk of their 51 or their 49%, which is how can we make it in three hours so that they can make it in four. So there are ways that that process can be enabled and Synergy has been designed as a modular system. We're almost done building the parts that will slap together in a week. And that's the idea, is that those parts are what the consumer will eventually get. Uh, the ways that you can do this are enabled by the design of the airplane itself. It's got a very large, strong wing. It's got a very large, roomy fuselage. So we don't have to scrimp on areas that would normally, like I've got my, my, wing, my fuselage cores are up to two inches thick in places. And that just means that I can just print that part and fiberglass it. It's quick and it's easy. How's the contest airplane coming? How's the contest airplane coming? Um, we are now going at the speed we should have been going about 18 months ago. The only difference is that now we have enough money to keep working on it. So we're making up for about a nine month delay. And uh, I would say that the odds are now 25% that we will make the Green Flight Challenge, which was never really our primary goal. It was just a nice $1.6 million bonus. The square footage? Um, square footage of the Green Flight Challenge airplane or the, of the K airplane? Okay, the one we're doing right now is 156 square feet of wing and about 44 square feet of tail. The equivalent of a two place? No, it's a six place. Yeah, Synergy was designed 
uh, as a practical electric airplane. The breakthrough was so significant that I couldn't put an electric motor in it. I needed to use something that was existing as a power plant. I selected the Delta Hawk diesel. So I designed this airplane for the Delta Hawk diesel for myself and my family, what we really wanted to do. <coughs> and found that, um, uh, you know, it was, it was a big deal. So the Green Flight Challenge then came along and our numbers said that we'd win it pretty much hands down if we could get it built in time. And the issue was, you know, do we have the dollars to do that? Do we have the resources? Uh, what do I expect the weight to be at? We're targeting 1,250 pound empty weight. Uh, the aircraft is designed around the 3,100 pound gross weight. Full scale load testing, absolutely. One of these pictures has got five monkeys standing on our wing. Actually, it's not even our wing, it's our uh, internal fuel tank core assembly. It's part of the wing. So, what G loading? Uh, that remains to be seen. My, my goal was 9G loading. 9G ultimate? Yeah. Are you using exotic composite? Am I using exotic composite? No, not really. These are uh, carbon fiber, Kevlar, and fiberglass. I'm using Kevlar and fiberglass up front for its robust durability and impact uh, and for its electrical transparency. Didn't want carbon fiber interfering with anything up front that I might be using the wing portable radios or electronics. Uh, but the wings are all carbon and uh, a lot of the foam materials are even off the shelf stuff. Spider foam, you know, fairly low density spider foam. Um, we do have some pretty exotic core materials. The yellow stuff that you'll see in some of the photos are uh, core cell, and that's uh, extremely expensive, but it's, it's an underutilized core in aviation. I'd like to see it get out there a little bit more. Yes, young man. Are there still plans for it, or how is it Uh, am I selling plans for it? Are we going to get kits out there? How much will they cost? Uh, the young man would probably like to know that when he's able to fly and get it up there. Uh, I don't know. You know, the, the thing about this is, is that the cost of the airplane is very low from a material standpoint. It's very low from a labor standpoint. It should be possible for this to radically impact the cost of getting into a uh, an airplane of this caliber. But it ain't going to work out that way, folks. I'm sorry to let you know. You've got airplanes that cost $130,000 that it's competing with. And the value proposition will probably be that this kit is just as expensive, or maybe a little bit less expensive, as everybody else's. And that has to pay for the extreme cost of getting there. Uh, there will be multi million dollar investments required to bring this to market and the volume that's, that it's going to take. Uh, I told people a long time ago that from what we saw in private disclosure, we need to build 10,000 of these things yesterday. And that's going to take some real horsepower uh, to invest in the necessary uh, tooling to do that. So I see it being like a VCR it was back in the day. You know, I, I remember buying a four-head VCR with $390. And it was a big deal, you know. And nowadays, 15, 20 bucks, and you can buy a digital thing with one moving part. Um, and so that's really where this will go over time. I think that the kit will become an affordable aircraft and it will probably be uh, in high demand as an expensive aircraft at first. Can you get a little more detail on the placement of the holes in the six horsepower blower you spoke of? I didn't speak of a six horsepower blower for Synergy. That's it back out. So what we do with our control air is we take it from the aft section of the wing we run it into the engine compartment. Okay, it's run by it through the blower and over all the cooling components. Your oil cooler, your air cooler, your intercooler, your exhaust, your turbocharger. And by the time it's done that in the, in the contracting volume and exits the vertical slot underneath the prop, it's an exhaust augmenting heated airstream that delivers significant cooling thrust. Yes, angular connections of the airfoil, and the question is interference drag. 
Um, that is really misleading to people, and I mentioned it earlier in connection with biplane interference. What causes a uh, what causes an interference condition at an intersection has nothing to do with the intersection. There's nothing that the air says, oh, I can't handle a 90 degree corner that's, if I look at it from straight on, if it's a 90 degree corner, I can't handle that. What causes the interference is what's happening to the air over here, what's happening to the air over here, what's happening to the air over here. And if we have a big fight happening across the surface, then we'll get interference drive. So what this, this is version 18 and the lens have changed completely. But when you look at it in 3D, you find out that there's a big stagger. Here's our quarter cord line. Here's our quarter cord line. And so there's actually a lot of three-dimensional transition happening there. But what prevents uh, any significant interference drag is the fact that this is a pressure surface, this is a pressure surface, and this is a pressure surface. I'm sorry, I did that wrong. The outside of the surfaces are all pressure surfaces. The inside surfaces are all suction surfaces the air is supposed to be doing. And when you get to the center section of the wing, the wing to fuselage junction is a, always a problematic uh, place for interference drag to occur. And it's hard to deal with. It was hard to deal with even on Synergy. And we on Synergy, we have it easy. The reason we have it easy is I don't have a big bump in my displacement volume on that graph where my wing starts. It comes to the wing, and as our sectional volume increases, it goes outward. So we actually are starting to pressurize the air out here about the time we're starting to need it to go back in here. That means that pressurized air out here is seeing suction air there, and we're causing the airflow to go back where it was before. All right. There's a lot of complicated stuff to that, but uh, that's the simplest explanation I can give you about why we don't have any uh, we don't have any real significant interference drag issues to be concerned about on synergy. Are the passengers fuel too much on the center gravity? And how does that handle the center gravity shift? The question is are the passengers and fuel on the center of gravity and how do we handle our center of gravity shifts? Uh, boy, that was one thing I didn't think. Uh, I didn't plan for it. I wish I could claim credit for it, but it just worked out beautifully. Solo, you're flying a lightweight ship and you're as far forward as possible. So you've got a fairly, that's actually your most rearward CG com, uh, configuration you'd normally get. And makes for a super awesome handling. Uh, you know, obviously I haven't flown it except in my mind and in the simulator, so let's just say that it's unproven. But, as you add weight, you need the center of gravity to move forward on synergy. Because we want to maintain the same proportion of downloading on the elevons uh, with gross weight increase. So as the plane gets heavier, we want to push down a little more with our tail. And it turns out that there's no way you can load synergy that doesn't do that and keep the center, keep the CG just dead on. It actually has a more than one foot range of CG, but you can't make it move that much. Yes. I'd like to hear a little bit about how long you've been working on this project and the history. Just a little more on the history and how long we've been working on it. Well, uh, I think I've been working on this since 1977. I just didn't know it. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I don't know how to describe that history except to say that it's in the, always, always, always been on my mind how to get uh, laminar flow, how to get weight propulsion right, how to get uh, bounder layer control that works, how to get long wingspan performance in a short wingspan package, how to make it not ugly. Uh, I don't know. It's just it, it suddenly came all together in one day. I was. Uh, I was at the computer and I had just finished reading some paper and suddenly Eureka, you know, one of these moments. I came running out of the room screaming at the top of my lungs to my wife, holy cow, you're not going to believe this. So that's about all I can tell you about that. Now, since that moment when I lost my mind, uh, I spent uh, thousands of hours researching to find out how close anyone had ever come to doing it this way. And I found out we've been really, really close many, many times. 
But even the people who advocated for those ideas and technologies didn't quite connect the dots, and they actually didn't necessarily believe what they were seeing. How do you expect icing to be addressed or impacting the design? Um, you know, icing is a, a significant issue for a certified airplane. I'm not really too concerned about it, but I've thought about it a lot. And I've designed ways that the structure uh, is favorable to the routing of um, heated fluids, to using electrical de-ice. I think good natural laminar flow airplanes are inherently less ice susceptible than others. Our primary ice susceptibility has to do with our control surfaces and whether or not our tails are, are affected. This is a big problem. Uh, and so at the level that we're at right now, we've studied it on a preliminary basis, a conceptual basis. And I don't see any big red flags coming, but I'll be trying to work with people who are more expert in that field. One thing I will not be doing is putting anything on there like boots that would destroy laminar flow. Okay. Will the full-size model have flaps, and what is our tail volume coefficients like? <clears throat> yes, the full-size model has a split flap from boom tube to boom tube. It's eight and a half feet long. It's there mostly as an air brake, so we have some way of adding to drag, but it does significantly increase our maximum lift coefficient. In order to demonstrate the CAFE minimum flat, uh, 2.3 maximum lift coefficient must be achieved, which we can achieve through a combination of the flap and suction. As respects the tail volume coefficients, even though this looks like a short couple, we've got uh, about 24 feet of horizontal tail <laughs> in terms of its width and uh, 44 feet of area squared. So our tail volume coefficient is normal for an Elevon equipped airplane. Not, not Elevon, I meant uh, El Oh my goodness. Full flying tail. What, what do we call it? Full flying tail? There we go. All right. And the same thing for the vertical tail volume coefficients. We have winglets and vertical tails. Um, and the fact that we have four of them, that they're high, high aspect ratio, and that they're actually already positively loaded. Uh, those factors dramatically increase the stability in both the horizontal and vertical planes. So don't let the short coupling fool you as solid as a rock. Yeah, one question related to that. When you have short and still same table coefficient uh, to be uh, quite a high area for the uh, day, and that means that you need a uh, small uh, 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 you need, uh, to get the moment, you need the high area, and so also high downforce. So it means, uh, yes, we're talking about the drag. Yeah, we have a lot of uh, we have a lot of drag because we have a lot of area because we have a high downforce. Is that what you're saying? Yes. And yes. The high downforce means high wing drag. High downforce equals high wing drag. Yes, absolutely true. Except that we're not putting it where we normally do. If I, have a, if I have a conventional tail on this plane up here, it's nice when it's back a ways, I can make it smaller, and I can minimize the area, and I can minimize the downforce. That's the normal way to uh, reduce the drag. But if I put a wing, not a wing, if I put a tail above and behind a wing tip in this location, now I want, I want to throw as much air this way as I can, as hard as I can. And there's an optimum. In the scientific literature, about 8% downforce delivers the optimum span efficiency for a continued wing configuration, like a C wing or a box plane. Okay? So if I've got an 8% download based on my gross weight, that mandates that I move it very far forward or I have to, uh, I have a, a plane that wants to do loops. So by moving it forward like this and delivering about 8% of gross weight in downforce, we're loading the tails a lot more than you normally would. 
and you'd think that that would be drag. But it's not. It's drag reduction. It's the same thing as having more wingspan and having better L over D. You added 20 feet of wingspan, but your L over D went to the moon. How did you do that? By adding wetted area and extra additional wing area. It's simple. You reduce the big penalty of induced drag. So a lot of counterintuitive stuff about that. I, one, uh, one thing I forgot to mention in conjunction with this uh, aspect of the double box tail is that because of it being short coupled, we have extreme control authority. But we have extreme control authority without a lot of travel. Okay? I was watching the videos in close-up and close-up telephoto views, and this is my this is my control travel when we're flying that quarter scale model. Okay? That's the amount of control travel. And at first we had too much control travel, that's one of the reasons people criticized the landing that was on the video. But the guy was holding it all together and he was just totally over controlling it. And I was telling him to land with a military style rollout and everything else. And um, the, the airplane doesn't need that much control authority. And the consequence of that and another aspect is that we don't see the continue, we don't see the, uh, the likelihood of any stall spin behavior whatsoever with this plane. I built quite a few models that would neither stall nor spin. And if that maintains its way into the full scale article, I think we've really got something. What I see in the simulator is bobbing like in a canard. Just, I was either going to have to immerse myself in that or immerse myself in the airframe. I thought the airframe was going to be easy and the motor was going to be hard. It looks like it's the other way around. It's on my mind all the time. I, I, I mentioned an amphibian. I think that uh, the appeal of slow and slow flight is strong for a lot of people, and it's very strong where we live. We have uh, high mountain alpine lakes all around us, and uh, you know nothing would be cooler than for us to just take off and fly up to a lake, and land, and fly fish for a while, and come back home. I think I think that's the coolest thing in the world. So I'm, I'm very motivated to get to the point where we have other iterations of effective, efficient, quiet, amphibian-capable flight. Yes, back there. Hi, John. How you doing? My name is Ricardo Foster from the GB Cherry. I just wanted to uh, thank you for what you're doing, and I have a have a quick question. Can you give us a take on your greatest challenge and a great success that you have had in this product project? Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Uh, a take on my green flight challenge. Is that what you're asking for? Yeah, what are your greatest challenges uh, with this project? The greatest challenge? The greatest challenge here has been communication. You know, everything that you see, every every single thing that you've heard and that you see, I've been saying it for a long time to people in private, and they don't get it. And so when you have a situation where, you know, you need to raise capital to do things the right way, there's this credibility gap, like, who am I? Well, I'm, guess what? I'm nobody, okay? We just have to do our work and somehow manage to feed our faces while we while we do that. That's all it's ever been about. And we've managed through the same attitude that most of you guys have and that this organization displays. We've managed to do that and we will just keep on managing to do that until we're done. And and a great success, please. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned the high speed and uh, and the Delta what's that? Uh, I'm not going to talk about performance specifications at this point. Uh, first of all, you guys wouldn't believe me. And second of all, we don't know. We haven't seen that actually demonstrated yet, so it's a little bit silly to, uh, to talk about. As far as the specifications are concerned, I wanted a big engine in this thing. And uh, the biggest engine that Delta Hawk offered was 200 horsepower. So I, I designed the airplane for that. Now at this point we can't get a 200 horsepower Delta Hawk. We don't even get 180, but that's fine. That's perfect for the Green Flight Challenge. As a matter of fact, yes. Do we have a Delta Hawk engine? No. That's one of the biggest factors to whether or not we're going to make it in time. Uh, 
No, only in general terms. Yeah, only in general terms. Because it's a liquid cooled engine, we've got a really beautiful opportunity in terms of radiator space and the design of the uh, cooling depart uh, compartment. It doesn't look like there's any challenge there, but man, I've got contingency after contingency after contingency built in so that we can open it up and get more cooling if we need it. Yeah. It seems like you spent a lot of time on molding and uh, the elaborate manufacturing processes. With all the neat aerodynamic things that you're doing, I'm wondering why you didn't go in a, in a more one-off, <laughs> rapid prototype direction. Okay, guilty as charged. Um, the question has to do with why did I invest so much time in modeling and, uh, and high-level uh, design integration uh, instead of just getting something flying and prove things out and so on. And the answer is I can't do it that way. Uh, I'm an all-or-nothing kind of guy and to me this, this kind of breakthrough deserves to be shepherded all the way through, start to finish. Nothing would kill all of these technologies better than a doornail faster than to bring them into committee within the typical structure that we have for uh, aeronautical development. I, I, I can't tell you how many times I've sat down with PhDs, and in some cases PhDs who taught me some of this stuff, and had them talk the entire program out of existence in the span of 15 minutes. So it, it, it just has to be done, it has to be done right. So the fear is with how production tooling, that when the finished aircraft is a success, when the production tooling is necessary, the money that's necessary will necessitate your tooling to be able to survive. Uh, well, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm following the, uh, the argument there. Well, uh, production tooling doesn't exist. This is being built with a one-off. If we were funded according to the original plan, we'd be building production tooling. But this is a one-off. Uh, and I'm exploring ways that are uh, not tool independent. So there's a, there's a lot of stuff that looks complicated that isn't. And uh, I want to speak to that integration and design thing for just a second because if you take, uh, you know, if you take a month to, say, to make something in SOLIDWORKS, combine the attributes of 17 parts, you save huge amounts of assembly and complexity down the road. I mean, I, you didn't need that jig, you didn't need this part, you didn't need that weight, you didn't need this liability. It's all built in. And so I, uh, the way that the kit is envisioned is that everything that has a complex geometrical shape is built in a factory. And if it's built in a factory, it's got all this stuff in it. So my wingtip right here might have, uh, you know, it's got a complex geometrical shape, so it'll show up to the home builder as a finished product, but it's gonna have the fuel, uh, the fuel cap door fully integrated, okay? It's gonna have the chase for the wiring, it's gonna have the wiring and the lighting and the, and the antenna stuff built into it. So everything that's downstream complexity is built into the complex parts. I didn't hear that. Integral versus bladder tank fuel cell. Integral versus bladder tank or fuel cell. Uh, an integral is fine for this type of construction. It shouldn't be any problem at all. We have a capacity for a ridiculous amount of gas. If you're flying with uh, Gen A and uh, the Delta Hawk diesel in Synergy, you have a transcontinental, trans-Pacific airplane. You can go anywhere you want to go. Uh, controls. Uh, one of the things I think is pretty cool about the cockpit design is uh, it's a little bit kid, kid in a candy store for me because I always wanted to be the, the guy in the F-16 on the pointy end of the airplane, right? So the cockpit experience up front is you're solo, you're surrounded by all the stuff you want, it's uh, not in your way, you've got a beautiful unobstructed view. But right behind you is a standard side-by-side -side dual arrangement. So you can fly it solo, you can fly it tandem dual, you can fly it side-by-side -side dual, or you can be an instructor with two students. Or you can fly side-by-side -side sitting with your wife and you can put uh, your VIP 12-year-old in the front seat. How about that? Where do you ingest the cooling air? Where do I ingest the cooling air? Uh, under the wing inlets, 
I'm sorry, under the wing, um, under the wing rope fillet. We kind of mock that up. It's not that's not how it actually will be. In fact, they're a little they're way up. Uh, we're using uh, mostly wet layup, but I've got some infusion parts uh, for vacuum assisted resin transfer. I'm not using any pre. Thank you all for your questions. It's been a real pleasure. We're going to take this party to the Aero Innovate thing, which is in the Innovation Center. Uh, that's where we'll kind of be uh, hanging out for most of the day today. And then we'll be around there from time to time if you have any questions. Thank you very much.